Good morning, church. Good morning to you all here in person and out there in the land of Zoom. We are so happy that the Spirit has led you all today to join us in worship. So as we prepare for worship, for those of you that's joining here in person, it's in our worship bulletin, and I'm going to begin the reading. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. This is James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Let the earth hear his voice. And Cliff Barrows didn't know it. 
He said, well, I don't know, but we'll try and sing it. And they sang it that night in London at the Billy Graham Crusade. The crusade lasted for three months. They sang that song almost every night. Let's stand together, and we're also going to sing another one by Fanny Crawford, with Blessed Assurance. Let's stand together as we sing. as we prepare for the morning prayer. Oh, our Father, some of us have had such a trying week. We come here because 
We're frustrated. We're spent. Our spirit may be low. Some spirits may be high. We know that you, you are our refuge. You give us the strength to make it through another day, another moment. Some of us are here because our spirit just needs to be rejuvenated. Our spirit needs to be set on fire. Oh, Almighty God, we know that you've never left us nor forsaken us. We know that through the frustration, you're in the midst. We know that with you by our side, we will conquer anything that comes our way. So thank you, Almighty God, for filling us up. Thank you, Almighty God, that we know that we don't go by what we see. We go by knowing that you've got our back. So thank you. We just give you the thanks and glory and praise in Jesus' name. And now, now we come before you united as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us so that we could have communication with you in knowing that no weapon formed against us will prosper because we are conquerors through you. So let us in one accord, my brother and sister, Pray the prayer that God taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, friends. Good morning. I've got a couple of things I want to share with you all this morning. First off, um, as we do every Sunday, I need you to let me know you are here by using our attendance register that's in your worship guides. The little slip that you just kind of rip off and put your, your name. Uh, you're already in there, you can put your name. But if you're visiting with us, uh, you can give us more information, let us know who you are, and give me a chance to reach out to you and maybe give you a phone call or email to find out more about you. We've also had a number of people who have put prayer requests so that we had a church in praying for what's going to do. Also at the bottom, if you uh, attend our Wednesday night uh, Bible study, we do have a meal time that we begin at about 6.15. Uh, we've had to put it down to 15 instead of 6 30, but we've had too much fun and have gone uh, too far into the Bible study hour. And so, uh, but if that's something you're interested in, then write your name at the bottom and we'll add to the tally that helps us know how many people to prepare to do for. All right, we've had our movie night most recently, so thanks to all who participated in that um, and uh, who helped set that up. We watched the Prince of Egypt, we surprised to I think some of our two and three year olds were running around and, and uh, filled up on cookies and all that kind of stuff. But it was a great time, a lot of fun this past season. There are a couple of things that are coming up for you to be mindful of. We have our back to school match on August 21st, starting at 12 30. That's going to be a wonderful time. Everyone's invited. And then we'll have the following. Sunday, August 28th, which will be a day of blessing, which will happen in our Living Again worship service. That is a day for us to offer a prayer of blessing for our educators, our school personnel, students, our parents, basically everybody. We like overwhelming that everybody will be blessing that Sunday. And so um, we're excited about that. And so a lot of things are gearing up as we're looking into the fall. So please. Uh, stay tuned with us and uh, on our website and all the different ways that we can communicate with you. And now at this time, it's our time to prepare ourselves to worship through giving. And so this is our time of offering. During this time, you can prepare your hearts and minds to give. As our efforts come forward, I'm going to offer a uh, brief prayer for us. And then we will give as uh, we do more in worship. Let's pray. Most gracious and kind God, there are so many ways that we see generosity with you. You are a God that, that offers blessing and mercy and grace upon us. Deserved and undeserved. The rain and poor will adjust to the unjust of life. Meaning that your provision, that your care, that your desire to see the well being of all of us falls in the times when we think and feel we are worthy and on the time we do not. It is with that generosity, God, that we are compelled to give today. Pray that you would receive that which we give. It may be a blessing to your kingdom, to the work of ministry here, and for the work that we endeavor to do beyond these four walls in our community, in our world. Thank you that we can participate in that group. It is in your name that we give and pray. Amen. Something that through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to depend upon his word. We're going to sing, hopefully, you know this song, uh, the verses and the chorus through it all.
Today's scripture reading is found in Acts chapter 16, beginning at verses 6 through 10. And if you're using your few Bibles, it's in page 90. It's entitled, Paul's Vision of the Man of Macedonia. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mesia, Maja, excuse me, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. for those in our congregation. Almighty God, you have set before us the path. We have wandered on our own way to try and find our way. Sometimes we are like toddlers. We hear your call and then come back. Still other times we are full of beautiful rebellion demanding to be cut loose and set free, not knowing how much we still need to seek your wisdom and guidance. And so this morning, God, we ask that you breathe your breath, breathe your spirit, breathe your energy, breathe your enlightenment, breathe your imagination upon us. Wake us up. Open our eyes, unplug our ears, that we might hear, that we might see, that we might breathe, that we might dream, that we might follow the ways of your extraordinary kingdom. Today, Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful for Margaret's discharge from ICU, and that she has been admitted into a regular hospital. Acknowledge her long road to recovery and also our hopefulness to fellowship with her again soon. We pray this morning for Alta, who has undergone a fractured hip, who needs comfort as she experiences the pain that accompanies that type of fear. This morning, we pray for Angela in preparation for knee surgery later this month the physical therapy which aids in a speedy recovery. Among these and many others, we lift up Samantha and Kay, Makiva, Joel, Terry, Peggy, Aaliyah, Dick, Joyce, and Bob, as well as for Cheryl and Robert as they grieve the death their mother, Blanche. Today, O oh God, remind us that there are ways in which you love us that we offer on the way. Remind us that you are our God. We hear your children. And we are never fully really grown up in your sight. That we always have so much more to learn. Help us to see you every day, to acknowledge that we need your wisdom and guidance, and help us to return to the path to walk towards you. For it is in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, that we pray and ask. Amen. So 
So this morning, the title of this sermon is How to Deal with Frustration. All this summer, we have been studying Acts, how the early church has responded to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have witnessed through our study the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We have witnessed the ever-expanding message of the gospel and how the barrier breaking good news is reimagined and reinvigorated our faith. We have also read of many examples of the disciples who resisted the Spirit misunderstanding the spirit and denying the spirit, not unlike the way that we often can resist the spirit today. We have also witnessed God's grace, which continually challenges our understanding and invites us into new life in light of the risen Christ. We have witnessed in our series the suffering that occurs when the people of God witness of God's community, which would live out in its prophetic and power. And today, we will be taking a look at an interesting passage in Acts, where the Spirit takes center stage, resisting Paul and his party from following through on the plan. They had prepared. And I find this short passage to be one of the most interesting passages in Paul's journey in preaching the good news. That is because we see many examples in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, of people resisting the Spirit of God and resisting God at work. But here, in this passage, this morning, that is not the case. For Paul is eager to do the work of God. Paul is eager to do the work of the Spirit of Jesus. But the Spirit of Jesus is resisting him. A sort of reversal in what we have come to expect. Nevertheless, this passage has profound implications of our understanding of our pneumatology, that is, the study of the Holy Spirit at work in the world. You see, Paul is accompanied by Silas and by Timothy and by Luke, and they have planned to make a journey northwest along the borders of the Mystian territory. They decided to go on into the area of the city in order to evangelize. The cities of the city were strategic as they contained the important Black Sea port there, as well as an interconnected Roman road system. Paul's plan to preach the gospel in these cities were where they were heavily populated and highly transient, were great strategic locations to spread the good news. And Paul and Simon and Timothy and Luke prepared to travel there, they are met with resisting from the Spirit of Jesus. Luke says the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. And that's really interesting language, the, the Spirit of Jesus. It's quite interesting because this is the first time we have seen this phrase in the New Testament. Ordinarily, we have seen the language of Holy Spirit. But this new phrase begins to signify the early church's development of their Trinitarian theology. It was the language that showed this sudden understanding that God is one and three and three and one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so Paul was already ready and prepared to witness there going to the Northeast and having a plan to travel there on gold. He began to experience resistance. 
And for many of us, the mere thought that God resists Paul, and therefore the mere thought that God can resist us, can make us a little uncomfortable. Even more so when we consider that good things, the things that we want to do for God, may be the very things that God in the Spirit might be resisting us to do. I'll tell you, sometimes that can cause us to be frustrated. What do we make of that? What do we make of God? Whom we know we can resist and often do, but what do we make of a God who, in passages like this, and also in our own lives, can also resist us? What do we do when our best intentions, when our good desires are resisted by God, leaving us frustrated and disappointed? We see in scripture and as close observers in our own daily lives that frustration does happen and it comes in many forms. There's the frustration of some specific hope or plan. Perhaps the college major that you pursued that was woefully more difficult than you. Perhaps there was an unexpected illness that came upon you and left you without your full amount of mobility. Perhaps there was a tragedy in your life that resulted in a trauma that leads to post traumatic stress disorder and anything to do with Frustration, such as a promotion opportunity that seems to go with someone else and then someone else and then someone else. But not to you. Frustration of a plan or hope that you had that didn't come to pass. But there are other types of frustrations. Frustrations across the whole expansion of one's life. Perhaps a learning disability that requires you to work harder than your peers in order to acquire the same mastery. Perhaps maybe a stream of unfruitful relationships that keep happening over and over again. Or maybe it's just a toxic family of work. And no matter how hard you try to be sent out to escape the toxic effect of it, and it keeps seeping out into your life. That's the point my friend Paul Ray once said to leave unseen so many of glorious sights. To leave so many lands unvisited, to leave so many worthiest books unread, unrealized so many visions bright. Oh, wretched yet inevitable spite of our brief span that we must yield our breath and wrap us up in the unfilling coil of death. So much remains of unfruited delight. That is the frustration of a life full of lost dreams. And of course, I'm The writer once said, I experience the growing resolve of the authentic. I'll say and the reality. That is the frustration of character. Paul would tell you about the frustration of character when he says in Corinthians that that which he wills to do. He doesn't always do, and then that what he wills not to do, that he finds himself doing. Paul would tell you that the frustration of character, the, the natural self, all the incorruptibility, mocks and battles and laughs at our promises to live for Christ as we ought to. But then there is the frustration of our dreams for a new world. The dreams of a just world where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness has an overflowing stream. Dreams that come up short. We know that scripture is littered with examples 
of this type of dream and this type of frustration. Moses, frustrated, wants to go into the promised land. Y'all know the story, a land flowing with milk and honey. But God set him on the side of God would not allow him to spread the land under his feet, but to die in the living in first grade. David had it in his heart to be the house for the Lord. But the Lord said, Where it has been good that you may desire that in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, David. Frustration sets in. And when God called Jeremiah, the prophet and preacher, with the dream of Israel reborn, after many years, he doesn't see the rebirth or the the, the, the excitement that he thought he would see, but he sees hostility and apathy and indifference. Lord, he cried out, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. That's the cry of a frustrated dreamer with a dream of fear. Then there's the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews, where hero after hero in the faith Generation after generation is what being unfulfilled. For well, even though they were heroes in the faith, both Abraham and Enoch and Noah and Rahab, Gideon and Samuel, and the list goes on and on and on. What does he do tell us? That even he died, having not received the promises that they had. I will know the theme or two about frustration. Frustration has a way of showing up in our lives. Yes, dreams unfulfilled. Yes, hopes left undone. For works that we were working toward and producing a harvest, and it was less than. We inspect our lives, we may discover ourselves. We have had some frustration and disappointment. But Paul, who planned to go to the ports of Bithynia, the Spirit forbade. The Spirit did not allow him. All plans were avoided. Preaching the gospel was important. Preaching the video was important, but the most important plans were rejected by the Spirit. So it's one thing to have a vision for God, one thing to have a vision for our lives. There is another to see it fulfilled in its proper time. It's one thing to desire within the heart, and it's another to heal the divine wisdom of God, which sometimes leads us to the question. We expect it to grow. What do we do in life? Uh, frustration. I, I believe this morning, if we were to ask the Apostle Paul, that he might say something like this. Hold on to the vision and allow faith for God to lead to God. For it's not all desire to preach that God resists. It's not all desire to do the things that God resists. But it is God's kindness that takes precedence in this situation. And it's something that we as humans need to be struggling with. Because our understanding of timing is predictable. There are 60 seconds in every minute, 60 minutes in every hour. There are 24 hours in every day. We predict that there are. 365 days in the year. 
might have to go in that and see if you are going to be or whatever. But the, the, the moral of the story is that we know how time works for us. God's timing is either our timing, and it is not confined by our predictability. For the God of age has a thousand years, and a thousand years has a day to God. That just simply means the God running the schedule of the tree by God told him. We learn to deal with our frustration. How do we have to take a page out of the book of the Apostle Paul? When he, being resisted by the Spirit, went another direction. He thought it gave him the release to go to the area that he desired to go in the first place. Not only shall we yield to God's timing, but we also look for God's peace in our disappointment. English Anglican missionary James Hansen in the 1880s dreamed of being a missionary to the world. Of great interest to him was the continent of Africa. After arriving, he encountered the challenges that the founding and different opposition and eventually rescued his dream for the company. Eventually, he was captured by the opposing government and defending execution in the face of the hope and dream. He was asked and thought about it. After spending some time to think about it, his response was this I refuse to be. I won't be. What a word. Perhaps this was the true state of fulfillment for him. The fulfillment that transcends frustration. For a God fear to found. James Stewart rightly observed that there are some who, when their dearest hopes are thwarted, grow rebellious. Others become embittered, while others have their nerves on edge. Rarely had problems, and that is the government of the world. Some go in further and handle with the divine purpose and seek the poor child. Even though I have to interfere with the divinity that shapes the wind and cut my own path, I am determined to get it. Have you ever been tempted in that way? Tempted in the face of what God is doing, but still trying to hold on to the very thing God is already doing to you away. Sometimes God will even let us grab or yet we have it in our clutches. We still can't rest. There is not peace. Attempting to hold on to bitterness, attempting to hold on to those things that, that God has already resisted enough, attempting to try to take it and the hold on to it. It's peace that we don't rest that much. That peace means allowing to be led even away from things by the Spirit. Your silence over frustration begins with accepting. You do not have control over things in life like you believe that you do. For everyone has will and desires. Yet we live as if God does not have a will and as if God has no desire. God does have will. God has desires not just for me and not just for me, but for this world. And we hold on deeply to our own desires, which sometimes lie up with God and sometimes with me. When we try to force God's hand, 
be made signaling signaling to us in the other thousands is more important than what God is doing in the moment. Paul does not resist the spirit of resistance, but rather than opening the door that the spirit holds it, he responds by going to make his own. For the spirit is already actively at work in preparing for their life. They, in the pursuit of God's will and desire, look for their own purposes. They found a different way. Perhaps the heroes of the faith learned that along the way also. For David, when he was resisted for building the house, I can imagine David saying, If I cannot build the house for the Lord, then I will be sure that there is a solid foundation. I can imagine the moment saying, If I cannot talk to the public stand, then I will prepare Joshua and make sure that they feel the house and leave when I am gone. I can imagine Jeremiah saying, If I cannot preach the way that I want to preach, and I will use sign X to share God's word. And I can see Paul saying, if we cannot go to the video, then we will go to Macedonia to preach tonight. So my question to you this morning is in light of all of the sermons that we are doing in our community in July, and in all of the sermons we are doing as a congregation. The only thing that we are doing is considering who is our neighbor and how we love our neighbor, both locally here, the intersection of Georgia and Fort Glenn, and in our homes, and in our communities, and in our schools, and in our nation, and our world. question to us is we remind you of the road rock. The willing to speak the great and grand vision. You don't want to What is it that's crazy? What is it that's keeping you from love tonight? What is it that God is assisting you and let us know? May also be turning to you in a different way than another time. You discern the spirit, you seek for God's wisdom. You find a way through to have peace in your frustration. As you search the matter, as you seek the will of God, you may hold fast to what is good. And doing so, even in your frustration, you find peace. Closing in is hymn number 408. Let's stand together and sing half faith with God. <laughs>
May the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take the light to the living. May the one who sends you send you now and then. For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you is the one who keeps you still. 